Take me where your river flows. I want to drive on your open road like the wilderness where we are born singing whoa. There's an ocean in your eyes, a million stars that paint the sky. So we'll drift down with the tide singing whoa. Someday, 
Good evening. Apologies for the delay. We were doing very important work in our executive session with our superintendent. Um, and I will now call the October 11th, 2022 meeting of the Ben Lapine School Board of Directors to order. I would like to introduce our participants this evening. To my immediate left is Amy Tatum and Carrie McPherson Douglas. Um, joining us uh, remotely are Shirley Olson, Marcus Legrand, and Shamika Montgomery. And then to my immediate right is Superintendent Steve Cook, Deputy Superintendent Laura Nordquist, and Board Clerk Janet Bojanowski, and I am Melissa barnes um, Chair of the Board. We have Aaron Trimble and Kayla Celadon joining us for ASL interpretation and closed captioning, as well as live Spanish interpretation of tonight's meeting is being provided on our BLS School Board YouTube page. Um, as a courtesy to our interpreters who have given me some reminders as well, just a reminder for everyone speaking tonight to please be aware of the speed at which you are speaking. Um, with that said, will you please uh, stand, remove your hats, and join me for the Pledge of Allegiance. I pledge, pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Thank you. We will now move to um, a review of the agenda. I am going to make one change to the agenda under our consent for action items. I will be pulling 6C, approval of Superintendent Cook's 21-22 evaluation to make a few final um, modifications based on our executive session. Uh, Superintendent Cook, are there any changes you would like to make to the agenda? There are no further changes to the agenda from us. Thank you. Fellow board members? Oh, yes, we will put it back on um, in November once those changes are made. Are there any um, other changes to the agenda from the board? Okay, great. So, uh, hearing no further changes, we will move forward with the one change that we are removing, 6C, um, from consent, and it will return in November. Now we will move to item number four on our agenda, which is the Champion for Students Award and Superintendent Cook. Thank you. Matt, you got me? Check, check, check. Mic check, there we go. Um, oh, we, we have a fan club in the house. All right. Uh, <laughs> All right. Nobody online knows what's going on, so let's get this started. Lindsay Corley, will you please come join me up front? Nobody said anything. They stop crying. We got to get we got to do this. This is exciting for us. Um, I am so honored to have Lindsay Corley up here with me right now, office manager for Mountain View High School as this month's champion for students. Thanks for coming up here. Uh, Lindsay's pretty incredible, folks. Uh, I think most people will know or, or most people who work alongside her likely feel the same. Um, but I guess that most people who simply pass through the Mountain View front lobby can also sense it. Uh, Lindsay's warmth, kindness, good humor, all permeate throughout the office. And I'd say that extends into the school building and facility. As an office manager, she has her hands in so much. She is smart and friendly, and her customer service is through the roof. Even when things are challenging, even when a sub doesn't show up, even when she's answering really tough questions, she always does it with a smile. She, she does regular chores like updating the website. She directs traffic. We were there uh, earlier this year, and she was talking with me, and she said mid-sentence, hold on, turned around and got a student focused in the right direction, all within 10 seconds, turned back around to me, continued her sentence in the exact spot it was supposed to happen. And she does it with a smile every single day. Um, I'd like to share a photo with you, and I think this photo is very telling. 
So she, this photo she shared with me uh, about a month and a half ago. Um, this is Lindsay as a student. How old were you in this picture? Uh, I was in fifth grade, so no, fourth grade, so I was 10. So I want you to notice what she's got set up around her. That's her typewriter. That's her desk with her with her scissors and her pens and her nail polish so that she is pretty in her role. Um, she was prepared at age 10 to be the office manager of Mountain View High School right in that moment. She was born to run our schools. When we celebrate Lindsay, of course, we have to recognize her incredible school spirit. She finds a way to bring humor and joy in every bit of the work she does. Um, I'd like to show another picture of her right now. She once wore a wedding dress for school dress-up day. It was fancy day. She has created a wrap for assistant principal's 40th birthday party. Principal Michael Hicks, back in the room, Michael, wave to the, the, the crowd we have here. Thank you. If she weren't here, school would come to a screeching halt. She does it all. Lindsay is the heart of Mountain View High School. Lindsay Corley, thank you for everything you do to create a warm, inclusive, welcoming environment at Mountain View High School. You're instrumental in shaping the school culture and helping our staff and students thrive. For your heart, for your smarts, for your joy and unwavering spirit, Lindsay Corley, you are this month's champion for students. You're going to have to come up here and get a picture here in just a minute. Lindsay Corley, thank you for all that you do to serve the staff and students at Mountain View High School. You do it all and do it with a smile. This award is in recognition for your know-how, your capacity to serve, your kindness, and your incredible spirit. You are the heart of Mountain View. The Champion for Students Award. Let's get a photo or two. I'm going to hand you the mic here in a minute, too. Okay, uh, Lander, can you be ready for a family? I want a family photo, too. <laughs> Lindsay, just, you got a fan club in the back of the room that, that you didn't know about. They did a really nice job of keeping this all quiet. I want to. I, I managed his calendar. This wasn't on his calendar. <laughs> Um, well, I, I, standing up here, I have to give props to someone else in this building, Katie Legacy. I, I, this is year 11 for me, and she hired me when I was very young, and I had never worked in a school, and I don't know why she picked me, but she saw something, and it, it's allowed me to grow into um, this job that I love that doesn't feel like a job because I come to work every day and I, I live my best life in sitting in my seat right where I'm at and all of these people. Um, I, I just am so happy to, to be at Mountain View and to serve our students and our staff every day. So thank you, you guys make my job wonderful. And I don't work at all because um, I love what I do. And so it's, it's not a job or work to me, but it really is. Um, it just, it fills me up inside. So thank you for letting me do this every day. One more hand for her. Let's go. Thank you. Lindsay. All right. That's our Champion for Students Award for tonight. Thank you. I hear some celebrations in the hallway. Um, well deserved. Um, we're going to now move into item number five, which is public comment. Um, and I'm really excited tonight because we actually have four people signed up. Uh, the board and district leadership value communication 
from students, families, staff, and community members, as it helps guide the work of Ben Lapine Schools. Public comment is just one of many avenues available to ensure this connection. Members of the public may always submit their thoughts, their questions, their concerns um, to the board via email as well as in writing. And individual board members may also make themselves available for phone, video, or in-person conversations as well. This said, I want to remind the public that while this is a meeting of the board of directors that takes place in public, it is not a meeting with the public. Um, it is a meeting of the board to conduct district business. As such, the board will not respond to public comment made during tonight's meeting. Instead, issues may be recorded and referred to the proper staff person to follow up with you, and I'll be um, doing so um, on an ongoing basis. We will now open for public comment and hear from stakeholders on topics in order that they appear on the agenda. Our policy is to typically allow up to two minutes per speaker until the time cap has been reached for that agenda item. We typically allow up to 10 minutes of comments per agenda item and 10 minutes of comments on non-agendized items as a whole for a maximum of 45 minutes of public comment during a meeting. A timer is provided on the large screen to ensure every speaker receives updates during the presentation on remaining time. And if the speaker goes over time or if the speaker's message is not in adherence with our policies, for example, being personally directed, abusive, discriminatory, repetitive, or off topic, I may ask the speaker to cease and terminate that speaker's privilege to address the board. Um, with that said, thank you all for being here, and we will hear first from Michael Millette. Millette, did I say it wrong? <laughs> all right. Um, Michael is, appears not to be here. His topic was a question about the new policy that middle school students um, are not allowed at high school sporting events without a parent. Um, I think um, I would like to direct, since I have read what his comment was, I do want to um, ask the superintendent to provide some clarity um, for the public, um, and especially for middle school parents. Um, around that policy and what, what necessitated what necessitated that and what, um, what families can do. Yeah, I, it went out to middle school. I'm speaking now as also a middle school parent, but it went out to, um, to parents that their middle schoolers could not attend high school events. Okay, I'm glad to look into that, okay. and we'll report back on it. Thank you. Um, all right, we will now move um, to hear from Matt McDonald. Oh, there we go. Okay, thank you. I, I will admit, for a guy who stands in front of a microphone a lot, this is a bit uncomfortable. Um, but thank you very much for having me. I'm Matt McDonald. I'm the father of two Ben Lapine students. They are receiving an excellent education experience, and I am very grateful for that. I'm also the news director at Central Oregon Daily News, which is your local ABC and CBS, and I'm here today in my professional capacity to address some concerns I have with how the district is communicating with local journalists. I'm not calling anyone out. I don't want to assign any blame. I don't even want to use any specific examples because I think that could go back to an individual. I just want you to hear my concerns. I think with sometimes the best of intentions over the past three years, the district has erected some barriers to answering questions. Simply signing up to speak for this board meeting, I thought I was fine to sign up last Wednesday. Turns out I had from Friday at 5 p.m. until Monday at 5 p.m. to sign up for the board meeting to be able to speak. I actually missed it a couple months in a row trying to do this. When we at Central Oregon Daily News inquire about an issue, we're often told the information will first be communicated to the board or to parents or to students, and I understand the logic, but there are a few issues. One, we're usually asking because parents, taxpayers, or students may want to weigh in on that issue before it's decided. Two, it often becomes the district's only communication to us on that issue. And that leaves the district in a position of self-determining the view of that particular issue without being questioned on it. I read the Source Weekly's article about murals at Miller Elementary with a lot of interest. I'm a parent of a child at Miller. I paid some of the money for those murals. As a taxpayer, I presumably paid for the pain and labor to cover those murals. As a journalist, though, I was reading with no surprise that it took weeks of dogged determination and public information requests to get enough information 
to publish that story and feel confident in what you were publishing. I just feel like it shouldn't take that. It should take a phone call. That's it. The questions your local journalists ask represent the broader community's concerns. I'm running out of time, so I'll try to wrap up as fast as I was can. just about to try. I was trying to catch. Janet, can we just allow him to finish his statement as long as it doesn't take more it's than a little? Like yeah. 20 more seconds. Um, answer what you can with candor, and more importantly, answer with immediacy. When you wait, when you delay, or when you determine the view that you're willing to answer within, it's, it's a blow to transparency. And the standard at Redmond schools, at Crook County schools, and 509J schools in Jefferson County is to make those answers available almost immediately, almost daily, for all of your local journalists. It sends a message to the community sometimes that you feel like you don't want to answer the question. And I don't think that's the case for Ben Lapine schools. I truly don't. Um, prior to this evening, I shared these thoughts with Jerry O'Brien, editor of the Bulletin. He regrets he couldn't attend tonight, but asked to convey that he has similar concerns. I also invited Nicole Vulcan, the editor of the Source Weekly. I believe you'll hear from her shortly. Thank you. Appreciate your time. Thank you, Matt. Um, we will now hear from Nicole Vulcan. Surprise, I'm here to speak with you about an issue of import. <laughs> Uh, my name is Nicole Vulcan. I'm the editor of the Source Weekly newspaper, though my most, most important job is a mother to a young, young, wonderful young person who just went off to college. I'd first like to share my gratitude for the many teachers in the Penn, Ben Lapine Schools District, namely some of those at Ben Senior High School whose commitment to students is absolutely commendable. My child earned an international baccalaureate diploma in 2022, and in spite of the pandemic and the disrupted learning that marked my child's high school years, the educators were outstanding. I wanna call out some who are actually in the room tonight, Paul Hutter, Jim Bright, Brad Edmonds, Heidi Friesen, Amy Sabadini, and Cassie Bullock, as some of those incredibly caring and knowledgeable educators who made a difference in the life of my child. So just thank you to all of you, and I'm so glad one of them is here, so I can say that in person to them. Uh, now my professional concerns. During my six years as editor, I've interacted with hundreds of public information officers. Um, like Matt, I recognize that some do this job diligently. In the best case scenarios, if we make a request and they don't know how to answer it, they at least respond with, hey, we're working on it, we'll get back to you by this date. In the worst case scenarios, they don't respond. They leave us hanging. They get back minutes before our stated deadlines that we told them the deadline time. Unfortunately, this is the experience in working with the communications team at Ben Lapine Schools for me and my team. Two examples. Earlier this year, our reporter spent nearly a month trying to get the comms team to help him set up an interview with a mental health professional at BLPS. That professional, after fi finally agreeing to the interview, subsequently canceled and only would answer questions via email. This was not a hit piece. This was literally a story about dis the district supporting student mental health. I'm almost done. More recently, after over a week of hearing next to nothing, I was given five minutes to prepare for a phone interview with a BLPS leader, central to a story I was doing on the Miller murals. Five minutes to learn who I was talking to and to prepare my questions accordingly. I ask you, is this the way you want Ben Lapine Schools represented to the people whose job it is to share vital information with the public? I've already shared these concerns with Dr. Cook and I believe I was heard. And thank you for that, Dr. Cook. If anyone on the board has further questions, I'm happy to talk further about it. Thank you for, being, for having me here tonight. Thank you, Nicole. And so I think that this is something um, that we have heard uh, from both uh, Matt and Nicole, and I know that the board is very committed, and I, um, in terms of being able to respond to you. <laughs> um, and so uh, if we can just continue with that relationship and um, your work with our communications team. And Thank following you. up with them. Um, we will now hear from Bill Haynes. Hey, Hayes? Oh, I'm sorry, it was misspelled in here. I'm so sorry. So I'm a parent of four boys all through the Ben Lapine school system. I'm here with some concerns as far as their education goes. And I think most of the teachers do very well. Sorry, my voice is kind of loud, I'll just move this up. Um, how long have you guys all been educators? Long time? So I've had a span of 15 years through my, my boys going through high school, all the way through kindergarten through high school here. 
And I've seen a huge change in the school. We now rank in the bottom third of the state for our high school. That doesn't sound like we should be patting ourselves on the back. To me, that sounds like we should be digging in and doing more work. We rank 44th out of all the states in the United States in education. I'm very concerned that the kids aren't getting the education they should be getting. And I'd like to know what your plan is to change that. Most kids that come out of high school, in fact, I did research today, 60% of them cannot read and write at the, uh, at the age that they're supposed to be at. There's a problem with that. And I go back to the board because you set the curriculum. Are we spending too much time on other stuff? Are we not spending enough time on educating these young people? I've got four very intelligent boys, three of them have graduated college. My other one's gonna try and go to MIT. They don't even have the programs that he needs at the Caldera School in order to do that. So it kind of makes me concerned that we're not doing our jobs. I'd love to hear from you guys on what you're planning on doing to educate these young people better. That's it. Thank you, Mr. Hayes. Um, uh, Superintendent Cook, are there are both of those factual pieces the bottom third of high schools in the state? Well, really, is the bottom third of high schools in the state correct? I looked it up today. Yeah, I'm just asking. I'm just I, asking. I'm not clear on where that data would be, but it, it doesn't seem to me to be accurate with what our student performance levels would be with our high schools and our state. Uh, even if you just look at our state assessments, um, we are one of the highest scoring school districts in the state, and so I'm not sure what that data would be referencing. Okay, thank you. Um, great, and, uh, and then with curriculum um, and what we're doing, you know what, that's what our entire year of board meetings is about, um, because we've set goals, we've set measures, um, we did the measures last board meeting, and really every single board meeting for this, for this year will be reports from our superintendent on the actions that he and his team are taking um, towards those goals. And the very first one is academic um, achievement. So I can answer that question for you. Um, <laughs> with that said, that concludes public comment for tonight's meeting. We will now move into number six, our consent for action. Um, items that are routine in nature are placed on the consent agenda. Any item placed on, consent, on the consent agenda may be removed at the request of any board member prior to the time a vote is taken. For example, I remove 6C. Um, all remaining items of the consent for action are then disposed of in a single motion. Items on the consent for um, action are for informational purposes only. I will entertain a motion to approve the consent agenda. I will make a motion to approve the consent agenda. I'll second. Thank you. Director Tatum has made the motion. Director McPherson Douglas has seconded. Are there any requests to remove anything further from the consent agenda? Since there are no requests for any changes, I will call for a vote. I will do a roll call vote um, since three members are joining us remotely. Director Olson? Aye. Director Montgomery? Aye. Director Legrand? Director Legrand, are you able to give us a visual or an auditory vote? Okay, we will move to Director <coughs> McPherson Douglas. Aye. Director Tatum. Aye. And I am an aye. Motion. And, um, Marcus gave a thumbs up through the Zoom. and Marcus gave a thumbs up through the Zoom. Oh, there it is. Perfect. Motion passes unanimously. Oh, technology, it's so fun. Um, We'll now move into item number seven, which is our reports, and we will start with item number seven A, um, which will be led by Leah Babo, our finance director. Thank you, everyone. Um, this evening, you'll find in your board packet and in front of you are, put it to my chin. Sorry, is that better? Oh, wow, this is wonderful. Um, in front of you and in the board packet, you'll find the quarter one financial statements for this current school year, 22-23. 
Um, I just want to call out a few highlights. Uh, one of them is our beginning fund balance. Um, we are going to be starting out the year just slightly up from our last presentation, um, from our June projections. Um, our auditors are also on site at this point in time to finish our audit for the 21-22 year, and at this point in time, we've not identified any reason to believe this fund balance um, will be adjusted in any way whatsoever. Um, we have made one adjustment to the 22-23 state school fund estimates. We have brought that down just slightly by about 914K. This is to compensate for a slight decrease in our enrollment over projections for this year. Right now, we um, don't have enough um, evidence from the rest of the schools around the state to see if that's a common theme, and so therefore will be adjusted as we go forward. Right now, I'm just adjusting for what I know, so that's really the only adjustment. Um, our expenses are pretty much at just shown at budget as we typically do for Q1. There's just not really enough yet to know what where things are going to trend in for our expenses. So right now that's leaving us with projected ending fund balance. Um, that's just going to be about under 11 million for the end of the year if these projections hold. But we're going to keep on top of revenues and expenses and adjust them in the quarters going forward. So does anybody have any questions? Is that, can you speak to why the county school fund is also down, same reason, or? Oh, certainly. Um, this last year, during the 21-22 year, we received federal forest fees as well as county revenues in a single, in two checks during the course of the year, and those have typically just been reported as county school fund revenues so that they could be included in our state school fund calculation. This last year, we get to eliminate or we get to keep the revenues, but we get to take it out of our, our uh, local fund revenue. So it's been reclassed down to the federal forest line. You'll see federal non-formula revenues as the offset for that. So no decrease in revenue there. It's just been reclassified. Anything else? Are there any questions from our remote board members? All right. Thank you very much. Thank you. We will now move into item number 7B, which is our college and career readiness. And I will be handing it over to Deputy Superintendent Nordquist. And I will be handing this over to Katie Legacy, our Deputy Superintendent, and Stephen Duvall, our Director of College and Career Readiness, and uh, some of their presenters, staff, and students from our high schools. Push the button so it turns green, got it. Thank you. All right, good evening everyone. My name's Katie Legacy and I'm actually not the deputy superintendent. I'm the executive director of high schools. <laughs> and I love that job. <laughs> nice try, Laura. Anyway. <laughs> Uh, <laughs> all right, so um, it, I'm so excited to be able to share with you over the next few minutes um, some of the outstanding programs that our high schools are currently offering. Um, there's four that we're going to highlight for you this evening, and I have a whole team here. Uh, we have students, teachers, assistant principals, a director of college and career readiness who are going to walk us through some of these programs. There's quite a few slides, so we're going to try to be brief. Um, a lot of information, um, and then we'll have an opportunity for questions at the end. All right, so everything that we're going to talk about for the next few minutes is really related to our outcome around students having a passion, a purpose, and a plan for their future. And we're going to be highlighting, as I mentioned, four different sort of overarching um, programs in that most of our high schools offer to varying degrees. So we'll be talking about career and technical education programs, international baccalaureate or IB program, which is at Bend High School, advanced placement, which is actually at several of our high schools, and then our college dual cre credit opportunities. So we're gonna take these kind of in each uh, section for each, and Stephen Duvall, our Director of College and Career Readiness, is gonna kick it off with an uh, overview of the CTE programs. Thank you, Katie. Um, I'm just really uh, happy that I get to 
be up here and kind of champion the amazing programs that we have in our high schools. Um, and so I'm gonna go over a little bit uh, of what those programs are and what CTE is. And then we have a couple of teachers with some students that really get to drive that home in terms of the amazing things they're doing in their classroom. So I'm very excited for them to, to get up here and speak. So just briefly, CTE in a nutshell is really around acquiring technical skills and professional practices so that students have the opportunities to go out and compete immediately for high skill and high wage jobs. Um, and so across our high school sites, there, um, what makes CTE different than say maybe an elective or another program um, is that every CTE course we have has to be tied directly to the industry standards. And so at the state level and with the consortium level among our um, ESD, there's a lot of work done to determine what those are. And so when we talk about standards and programs, um, there is a direct link there so that we are, in, uh, let me slow down. I go way too fast, so you can remind me of that. Um, so yeah, so there's a direct tie to those industry standards so that we're ensuring that the students in those classes um, have the, the skills that are gonna be relevant and we're not teaching in a vacuum that doesn't translate when they leave. Um, additionally, all of our CTE programs have to be aligned with a higher ed program in a community college. Some of those programs we articulate for dual credit, but regardless if we do that or not, all of them have to be aligned. Um, and finally, uh, um, a mandatory component of CTE um, education is a work-based learning experience. And there are lots of different ways to do that. But uh, at the heart of it, this, the, the goal is for students to get experience doing the job in the school setting or at the job site. So when they leave, they'll have um, practiced and had opportunities to do the things that are gonna be asked of them. Across our sites, we have 33 programs across our seven high schools. Some of those are considered full programs um, and others are considered startups. That's a designation that the state gives um, in terms of uh, building the programs. A lot of times we'll start in a startup and there's, um, it allows for us to build it the right way. Um, to be a full program, you have to have three full credits um, of that program. And so for some of our programs that are just beginning, like at Caldera or at other sites, we aren't ready to have three credits, and so we're able to start with a startup designation and build that towards that three credit minimum. Um, Twelve of our programs offer industry certification, meaning that if students go through that process, they walk out with a certificate or a, um, uh, um, a, basically a piece of paper that says that you are ready to go. Um, for instance, we have certifications in the um, American Welding Society for our welders. We have um, uh, firefighting and upland uh, forestry certifications in our um, natural resources program. We have food handlers permits in our culinary programs. And so we have real um, industry certifications that students can get and leave our high schools with that can allow them to be competitive in that market. Um, and then I think this stat's amazing, um, that 65% of all of our high school students from the 21, 20 and 21 school year earned at least a half a credit in our CTE programs. So two thirds of our students are going through our CTE programs in some capacity, and I, I think that's a testament to the amazing diversity of programs we have and the teachers that teach them. So this graphics, which is probably hard to see in this light, I've asked for you guys to receive a copy of that, highlights the programs we have and at which high schools they are at. Um, as you can see, those are the list of the programs of study, and then next to those are the 33 high school programs we have across our sites. Um, and so you can kind of take a look at that for a second and just see the variety we have um, and that a lot of programs are offered at multiple sites. All right, so I also wanna talk a little bit about data. Um, I can tell you what the colors mean so you don't have to read the fine print, um, but I think it's important for you to see who's participating in our programs. Um, and they are broken down um, by different categories. And so the dark turquoise or teal bar on the far left are students who've taken a half a credit, basically one course of CTE in a program. The students in the lime green are students who have taken one full credit in a program, not in CTE in general, but in a program of study. So two, one, two classes or one credit in construction or in culinary. The students in the turquoise on the far right 
are students who have taken two full credits in a single program of study. And so the big bars on the left are all of our students um, and the breakdown. So you can see, as to be expected, going from a half a credit to a full credit to two full credits in a program. There is to be expected to be a drop off there as students determine what pathway is correct for them. Um, and then we have that data broken down by race. And so we have the, um, if there's nothing there, the N is too small for uh, the state to publish data. Um, and so we have our Asian, Black, Latinx, um, multiracial, and white students broken down. Um, and so as you can see, the same kind of pattern um, in terms of the most with the half credit um, and then um, one credit and then two. Um, but as you can see with our Latinx population, um, the percentage of students taking a uh, course in general is close to in line with our general population, which is great. Um, but there could be some work to be done in terms of um, those students that take two full credits in a course. Here it is by gender. All students compared to females and males. Again, half credit, full credit, two credits. And so we tend to have a little bit more participation from our male students at this time. Here it is by ELL, um, all students, current ELL students in high school, students who have been ELL students in K-8 that no longer are ELL, and students who are not ELL. Um, uh, I think a, a highlight there is looking at our students who have formerly been in the ELL program and comparing them to students that have never been. Um, and there's some, there's some great numbers there in terms of participation, but again, some growth areas when it comes to students who are currently in the ELL program participating in our CTE programs. IEP status is a celebration, um, I feel like. Um, students that have had an IEP in high school um, are participating at an equal or higher rate than students who do not, um, and so I think we're doing a lot of great work there with our special education programs and getting those students involved in CTE programs. I also just want to note that while in our middle school programs, um, we don't technically have that same CTE umbrella in terms of requirements from the state and state funding. We do have many electives that align vertically with our high school programs, so students can start to dabble in those subjects in the middle school area before they travel up into the high school. And something new we're going to do this year is give students an opportunity in all of our middle schools to come up and visit the CTE programs in the high school they're forecasted to go to and do some hands-on learning before they forecast for those classes. And so with that, oh, do you carry just, just one quick question. Yep. That, sorry if you said this. I was looking at the data. Is that, is that just not a possibility in middle school, or are we just not doing that in middle school no, that's yet? No, that's, that's at the across state. The state. It's, it's a state thing. Okay. So CTE, Perkins funding. We can devote some of our funds to support CTE-like programming in the middle school. And so we do have those high school success dollars that we funnel towards middle schools. There's a limitation on how much of those dollars can go. Um, but in terms of those programs getting Perkins funding to be an actual program of study, that's just not something that's statewide period. So it's not an us thing. Yeah. And we have a question from Director Lagrange that uh, Dr. Nordquist is going to read. Uh, Marcus's question is, is there a way to add the expanded option of the cultural programs that COCC has to these numbers? Because many of our students receive college credit for them as well. Uh, next, what can we do to encourage more black African students to pursue the IB program as a district? And I think I'll um, defer on the IB one until we talk about IB. Um, as far as the first question goes, these numbers for participation come from the state when, it when it, uh, students earn the high school credit. Um, with uh, expanded options, they are earning both a high school credit and a college credit. Um, so I'd have to double check how those are included, but I'm imagining since they are also earning a high school credit in some capacity on the transcript, and we code that as a CTE class on the transcript, that they are, are likely included. But Dr. Director Legrand, I can definitely look into that and follow up with you to give you a definitive answer on that. All right, with that, I want to get out of the way. Um, and hand it over to a couple of amazing CTE teachers and staff. They're going to highlight their programs to further drive home the amazing things that are happening in our schools. So with that, I'd like to inv in invite Tiggy, De Tiggy Deerdorf and Becky Tucker up with some of their students to chat about their programs. Hello, board. My name is Tiggy Deerdorf. Um, 
I have one of the best jobs in Ben Lapine schools. I work at Mountain View High School and I'm a wood shop teacher. So I do construction, um, a lot of safety starts out my year. And then once uh, the safety is through, kids work their magic and they get to use their hands and build crazy cool stuff from cutting boards to spatulas to you name it. Um, their, their mind's really the limit on where they can go. The students I was gonna bring today canceled at the last second because they're in extracurricular activities, which is awesome because <clears throat> I have everybody. I have uh, cross country runners, I have dance, I have the football team, I have the soccer team, I have all different types of kids and backgrounds. And it really works um, well for me because in the long run, everyone's gonna have a house or be in a house um, once they leave high school, and they need to be able to know how to work on things and use their hands. Um, where the middle school thing, I wanted to kind of plug because I grew up in a place where I had wood shop in the middle school, and I really think that developed well for me in high school, and if these kids had better access to it, um, it would make my job a lot easier. <laughs> <laughs> my job's pretty easy as it is, but... Um, I, I do a lot of like uh, job skills. I teach I teach these kids not only you know woodworking, but I teach them how to be on time, how to be respectful, how to clean up at the end of the day, um, integrity, how to take pride in what you do when no one's watching, and um, it's it's a lot of fun to watch these kids learn how to build things with their hands, but also just light up, you can see it in their eyes when they've made something they get to take home to their mom or their dad. Um, I wanna extend an invitation out to everybody on this board. My classroom door is always open. Um, please come visit, check it out. Um, if you ever wonder what's going on, and that goes across the board to all of our CTE programs, at least at Mountain View, I would imagine everywhere else too. Um, thank you for your time and I appreciate what you guys do. Hello, I'm Becky Tucker. I teach business at Caldera High School, and I was previously the CT coordinator and business teacher at Bend High School. And tonight I have two students from Caldera and two students from Bend High. Um, basically, we wanted to share with you that our program is doing some amazing things for students, and we are trying to do that district wide. So, not just myself, but the teachers that teach business at all the high schools in Bend Lamhine Schools, we're trying to collaborate district wide to bring workshops bring these CTSOs and clubs district-wide to all students. Um, we've done some regional workshops and these guys have led them. So I'm gonna let them talk here soon. Um, but some things to think about, we would really love your support and funding and supporting CTSOs and these clubs just like you do athletics and um, giving these kids another option. I will let them introduce themselves and give you a little chat about what it means to them. Um, hi, I'm Margo Samford. I'm a senior at Bend High and I'm the DECA president for the Bend High DECA chapter. Um, I immediately fell in love with DECA when I joined my freshman year and it's really reaffirmed my love for business and it's something that I know I wanna study in the future as well. It's given me, as president, I've been able to work with other students within our chapter as well as with the other Caldera chapter and we planned a DECA workshop last week or so and that was really cool because we got to run it and really share my love for DECA with all the other students as well. Hi, I'm Nick Austin. I'm, the, I'm a senior at Bend High and I'm the vice president of DECA at Bend High as well. Um, I really love DECA. I joined because we have a shop called the Java Bear and I was so excited to work in the cafe types thing. And then after that, I started like researching, oh, what is DECA? And then I fell in love with it as well as Margot. And um, it's really taught me that I love to teach kids. I love leadership. And it's really helped my confidence. Freshman year, I was so scared to compete. But seeing these older members being so confident with themselves, I'm now able to compete and help them learn. And I think it would be really great across the district just so other kids have the opportunity to um, explore what they like, especially in business and entrepreneurship and leadership. And it's really helped me figure out what I want to do in college and career-wise. Thank you. 
Hi, I'm Reese Bradbury. I'm a sophomore at Caldera High School and I'm the marketing manager for our DECA chapter. I joined DECA last year and it was my freshman year and it was really one of the only clubs at Caldera that I was really excited about. And when I joined, the environment was really welcoming and I enjoyed what we were doing. I went to the SCDC state tournament last year and I competed and I talk very fast, so it made me slow down, and I think in the future this is what I needed for my career path. Hello, I am Claire Harris, the Officer of Hospitality over at Caldera, and it, DECA really has helped me talk, like, it has helped me work on my, like, speaking skills, as well as expand my repertoire in just business management. Uh, I have really enjoyed every moment that I have been a part of the club, even though I was dragged into it by my predecessor. Uh, <laughs> it's still, it's a very good experience and it's a very welcoming environment. I highly suggest it for any kid that is even slightly interested in business because it really helps you grow for the business world. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you all so much. I will Can just I? really quickly say thank you. I'm a huge fan of DECA, and thank you so much for representing your chapters so well. Can I get a little more detail on the comment about um, funding our clubs the way we do athletics? Well, do you want to talk to that, Becky? I can talk about, I know what we currently do, but do you want to give your teacher perspective as well? You always need more funding, right? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Oh, come on up. We want to hear from you. <laughs> starting a new school, starting a new chapter, you get zero funding. So everything is fundraise, running a student store with no startup. Um, and so we're running a small business or two small businesses and teaching full time. Um, uniforms, I mean, you see them, they look great, right? They cost a lot of money. So things like that. I know we try really hard to get athletics uniforms and get things started up for schools, but we don't think about the clubs. So that's just something. Thank you. That definitely sounds important to me. <laughs> yeah, we do have separate funding for athletics, um, as, you, as you probably know. Um, and then all of our high schools get high school success um, discretionary dollars allocated to them based on the historically underserved population and their enrollment. And so our principals have some choices they can make regarding how they allocate those funds to our schools. So um, one of the things that they do um, fund a little bit more uh, is the C are the CTE programs, of which the ones you've heard about from tonight. Um, Equipment, uh, Perkins funding is the overall sort of federal funding that schools will get when they're starting up a brand new CTE program. But once a, a program gets going, or if it's more like a club, like what Becky was, was talking about, that doesn't come from Perkins, that really comes from the school or the district. And so they are expensive. Um, several of these programs, once you get them started, you know, like a metals program or an auto technology program, you get the initial startup money for the expensive equipment or even things like uniforms and that kind of thing, but then you don't get, the money just kind of runs out at the federal level, so we have to continue to try to keep those going. And our teachers and students do a lot of fundraising for those programs um, to keep them, like Becky just spoke to specifically. So it's a lot. They have a passion for it, and the, the students love it. Um, and, I mean, the program, probably not the fundraising, um, but the reality is they are expensive. It takes, it takes a lot to keep them going and get them started, so. Um, I did want to say one thing just real quickly about the, th the four programs we're highlighting. So we do have CTE programs at all of our high schools now. Um, we're, we're looking to continue to build those. We have dual credit at all of our high schools, which we'll talk about a bit later, and AP at most of our high schools, except really for Bend High. Bend High has a few AP courses because their main focus is IB. But I think what's exciting um, when you think about this program in our high schools is uh, we're, we're able to offer this kind of diverse programming at all of our high schools, not just you know one or two have this and one or two have this. So I think that's exciting. And also it was really difficult for, for Stephen and I as we were thinking, who do we 
invite to come and highlight programs tonight at which schools because literally there are so many. And so again, um, as Tiggy mentioned, um, to invite you to come out to our high schools and see some of these programs and we'd really love for you to take us up on that because there's a lot to see, more than you're even hearing about tonight. And I think tonight's pretty special. So thank you Becky and Tiggy for being here and thank you DECA, DECA students for being here. We really appreciate your time and your energy. Thank you. So I think we're gonna transition now into the IB program. Um, I think that's our next slide. So International Baccalaureate. So at this time, I'd love to invite Paul Hutter. He is our interim assistant um, principal over at Bend High School. He's also the IB coordinator, and he has several students with him to highlight IB at Bend High School. Well, board, thanks for having me. My name is Paul Hutter. I'm uh, one of the IB coordinators at Bend High School. Uh, I'm also a veteran IB science teacher and philosophy teacher. Uh, this year, I'm also the interim principal, uh, assistant principal at uh, Ben High. Um, I'll go through a couple of these slides. There's a lot of data on here. Um, I'll highlight some of it. If you want me to um, slow down and address any of it, please let me know. Um, I would say the first thing that um, that you'll that I'd like for you to know is that there's multiple ways to access um, IB. Uh, international Baccalaureate coursework. And the first way I'm gonna call that a la carte. Um, a student can uh, pick and choose, uh, kind of like if it's just a college course or an AP course, you can do the same with an IB course. So if you uh, wanna follow your passion, follow some, your interest, uh, we try to remove as many barriers as we can, allow students to access um, those, those courses. The other way to access IB is what's called the IB Diploma Program. And I've got three experts on the IB Diploma Program with me right, uh, right now. Uh, oh, four, excellent. <laughs> Margo's here too. Um, and the IB Diploma Program is, uh, it's much more intensive, it's much more holistic, and, uh, and I'll, I'll talk a little bit more about that, the IB program, uh, Diploma Program and what it, that is in, uh, entails. Um, so just a couple of the statistics. Um, our test takers were down a little bit um, last year. I think the confidence in students over the last couple of years and signing up and paying for exams, it's probably um, uh, took a little bit of a hit, but overall we had about uh, just under 400 uh, subject exams uh, that we uh, gave last May. Um, the subject, sorry, the diploma candidates were up at 27 students last year. That is uh, a pretty good typical uh, average for Ben High School. We're pretty happy with that. Uh, as you can see, 21 teachers, um, and then that last statistic, over 1,000 seats. And those are just juniors and seniors uh, at Ben Senior High School. Though. So the number of seats uh, that we're teaching IB. Um, the school-wide, we've got some amazing stats this year, so I, I'm gonna come across, come across as bragging. Um, we did incredibly, incredibly well. And, and I think one, I'm gonna attribute that to a couple of different things. Um, one, the students, I think, we're really excited to have a target to, to look at uh, and to focus on. Uh, we hear a lot about the learning gaps uh, with students and we think a lot about um, what has happened over the last couple of years and uh, what is it, how are we measuring their success? And we are fortunate at Ben High School to have the IB program and to have a target. We were able to compare ourselves, not just how we were doing in our, in our classrooms, but we could compare ourselves to how kids are doing at international schools all over the entire world. And we can look up and see how we're doing and how did we, um, how did we match up. And man, did we really do well last year. Like we really, really did well last year. Um, for Ben, uh, for IB, uh, a score of four or higher is a passing score. And uh, that means in uh, Washington and Oregon and Montana, and I think Indy is over in Montana, right? High B diploma candidate last year. Um, I, Oregon, Washington, and Montana, a score of four or higher is gonna be automatic college credit. That's a state law. So uh, you can see our uh, average IB exam score is just under a five out of seven. So we're doing really, really well right there. Go down a little bit and you can see all of our students that uh, took exams in English and foreign language, every single student passed 100% pass rate, which is great, but it tells me we're not pushing hard enough. It tells me that we need to get more kids to step up to the plate. If every single kid is, is uh, hitting a home run, then we're not, giving enough students a chance, I think. So we're gonna try to increase those opportunities. Even uh, the others, individuals in society, science and math, we're still over 80% passing, so very, very proud of those as well. 
How do we do here in Bend? How does Bend High doing uh, when we compare ourselves with the rest of the world? The IB program is in 150 countries. There are 3,000 uh, world schools, uh, Bend High being one of those 3,000. 87,000 students globally are shooting for an IB diploma. These four up here um, are some of the students that are also this year uh, that are gonna be going for an IB diploma. I'm very proud that they're um, gonna be trying to earn that IB diploma. The average number of IB diploma candidates at a world school, so if you look at all of those world schools, the 3,000 world schools, the average number of candidates is 30.19. Uh, Last year we were at 27, this year we were at 42. So we're right in line with how we're doing uh, in terms of the number of students that are uh, shooting for that IB diploma. So I think that we're doing okay. The teachers that are exceeding the world average. So we don't, um, you know, we, we think we know how the kids are doing. Uh, and then we have them turn them loose in May and have them take all of these exams. And then we get our results in July. And the results started to pour in. And we just were in incredibly excited to see how well the kids did and how well the teachers did. So uh, English um, language and literature, French, environmental science, psych, world religions, and math all beat the world average scores. Um, and some of those are typically a two-year class, and we're teaching them in one year, and we're still beating the world average. So congratulations to those teachers. Our diploma class, um, we had a 96% pass rate. 26 out of 27 kids that were going for their IB diploma earned their diploma, which is amazing, beating the global average. We also had a student this year earn a 44 out of a maximum of 45 points. That student is in the top 2% of students in the entire world. We're talking about private schools, international, all over. Um, that student is uh, down in California in college right now, doing amazing. Um, just, I just, you can tell, I'm just very excited about the program and how well our kids uh, did last year and how well they're gonna continue to do. Uh, we have some statistics you'll see. Um, we're doing, uh, I think um, Mr. Legrand was asking about access to IB and increasing IB. We're always looking to try to increase uh, access to IB. I think one of the things that we could be doing better is trying to um, run programs 6 through 12 and really getting kids to understand what IB means starting in the middle school as they come into Ben High School. Um, I think we could be doing a better job in ninth and 10th grade at promoting the uh, IB. Um, and then there's another thing that we can do, which um, is potentially expanding IB at Ben High School, which is something that we're looking into, which is not just the diploma program. We're gonna look, be looking into something called the career program. And I look forward to giving you an update on uh, that investigation as we do that this fall. So um, I can follow up later on with that. Stephen, thank you for pulling uh, these uh, together. You'll see a lot of students are taking not just one, but two IB classes. Many IB classes are two years long. So uh, English being one of those, it's a two year long class. Math is a two year long class. Physics, biology, so some of our classes are two years long. That does sometimes um, create a little bit of a barrier, uh, depending on when a student wants to begin taking IB coursework. Um, I'll wrap up and uh, introduce um, our students uh, in back of me, um, but uh, I am very uh, happy to see the trend for students that are trying to access IB coursework. We were at 27 in, May, in uh, uh, our 2022 uh, graduation year. This year, uh, we are at 44, I think it's actually 42 right now, and um, our current 11th grade class is uh, 63 students which is I think just under 20% of all of the kids in 11th grade have decided to challenge themselves and go for an IB diploma, which is a really impressive number, I think. So we're very proud of that. So uh, with that, um, I think that um, I'll, I'll turn it over to our experts here. Um, these students have decided that they are not only going to take some IB classes, they've decided they're gonna take an IB class in English, in language acquisition, in social science, in science, and math. They've also decided that they're going to challenge themselves to be creative, to be active, to serve their community. They're also going to write a six-month research paper called the Extended Essay, and they're also going to take a philosophy co course called Theory of Knowledge, which is a two-year class which asks, how do we know what we know? So um, if you guys would please introduce yourself and let us know how IB is helping you. 
Um, hi, I'm Ivy Montoya. I'm a senior at Ben High. I'm pursuing the Ivy Diploma. Um, this program has really helped me like know that I want to go to college and pursue a career and go to graduate school. Um, as a first generation American, I didn't actually believe for a while that I could actually like pursue a further education. And what this program has actually helped me know that it's attainable, even though it's a really hard courses and the extended essay that took up a lot of my time, it also just taught me that I can research, I can work hard, and it's not something that's not going to be available just because of my background or something like that. And it's just, it's also really taught me resilience. I, it's a really hard program and I've struggled so many times, but I've always just kept on pushing through because I know that the diploma is like right there and I can get it. And just if I keep on going and working hard and I felt like my teachers have really supported me and having smaller classes have taught me that I can, it pushed me out of my comfort zone to ask for help and to better understand a subject. So I feel like I've built a really close relationship with my teachers as well and I've learned to love school as well. Yeah. Hi, my name is Solly Lockman. I am a IB Diploma candidate. I feel like IB has really helped increase my confidence in participating in college level coursework. Um, we are currently enrolled in five or four to five college level classes, um, which is really hard and <laughs> uh, taxing on a lot of us academically and mentally, but it increases our confidence in being able to handle that college level coursework. I think there are some like unavoidable, unavoidable fallacies in the way that IB is done at Bentai. Um, in general, our class sizes are very large, especially on an international scale, because we are a public high school. Um, <laughs> excuse me. In general, a international school will have a class size of like one to five to ten students where they can get individual feedback and really work one-on-one -on -one with their teacher. We are enrolled in classes of like one to 30, um, which is challenging, but also speaks very highly of us as students. Thank you. <laughs> <laughs> Hi, um, I'm Harper Rich. I'm a senior at Ben High doing the IB diploma. Um, I think for me, like Sally said, IB has also really helped with my confidence, specifically towards pursuing college um, and trying to aim high, uh, because I feel like if I can pass all five of my exams this year, uh, even my hard HL ones, I can probably handle just about any college class. <laughs> um, and it's also helped kind of expand my horizons in other ways too. Uh, like for example, this year, I'm one of four other students at Ben High taking high level physics, um, which is really fun <laughs> to be in a class that small. And before I started taking physics, I wasn't really considering STEM seriously, but now I'm considering maybe majoring in it. Um, and also, um, I don't know. I just feel like um, when it comes to IB, um, part of it too is like those closer relationships with teachers and getting to know your cohort. Um, and also, um, I've done a lot of honors classes and I've done a lot of high level classes over the course of my high school career. And I can confidently say, some of the IB classes I'm taking this year are the hardest classes I've ever taken in my life, which is great to be challenged that way. So yeah, I think IB is great. Thank you. Yeah. Um, hi, Margo Samford again. Um, I have been a part of IB now. Yeah, I'm a senior now. Um, I've really enjoyed it so far. I love the breadth and depth that IB goes into. It really gives you that global perspective because it forces you to look at things in a really different way. Um, I traveled abroad this summer and I got to meet a lot of other students from other countries and they had very similar experiences to me because they were in the IB program. And it's really challenged me to kind of open up my eyes and you get kind of an interdisciplinary like study. Like in French, we're studying like envi the environment. We're also looking at 
secularism? Secularism in France and just studying all these different cultures and it really gives you just a wider worldview. Thank you. <laughs>
Um, we do have some students that are accessing IB coursework in 10th grade, so there are some students that are doing that. But um, I think the, the, the monetary constraint, um, it's, it's, it, it's a lot of money to get our teachers trained, um, and so that's, that's probably the biggest constraint, is, is trying to um, get all of our teachers that we want. Uh, we've got 21 teachers. Uh, the curriculum changes every seven years, so every seven years, there's an, uh, every year there's another subject. Uh, that need, the students need, uh, teachers need to get updated and, and um, go to a workshop. A lot of those are all over the country. So that's part of it, but I think the other, but without giving excuses, I, I would love to see a more, um, I'd like to see us be more collaborative, six through 12, and trying to uh, reach those students at Pilot Butte to get them engaged in nine and 10 so they feel ready. Uh, for uh, maybe a diploma program. There's another program, just to kind of tease it out there, a little bit of a carrot. There's something called the career program, and that's what we're currently looking into. The career program is kind of IB light. It is, instead of six courses, it's, a, it's two courses with a focus on a career, um, a two-year research project on a career. So for a student that might want to um, maybe take a, a, a woodshop course um, for all four years of high school, if they could maybe uh, pair that up with something like a Spanish course and a math course, they could graduate with an IBCP certificate, which is similar to an IB diploma. So we're, we're currently investigating that. We think that that might expand some of those um, options and possibilities for our kids. Thank you. Sorry to keep asking questions. It's clearly something the board loves to hear sure and learn Paul about. Paul would love to stand up here and talk a lot more, and he's just awesome energy at from Ben High for IB. So really appreciate that. Paul, thank you for being here and thank you for bringing your students. It was a joy to listen. Um, I'm really glad you brought up that question, Amy, because that is something we've been talking with the, with the Ben High team about is the possibility of expanding the middle years program into nine and 10, because actually it is a six through 10 program. Um, and they're really looking into that and we're exploring that other career option too. So thanks for bringing that up. I don't know about you guys, but I'm having a really good time. Isn't this great? It's fun. All right, um, so we're gonna, start diving into advanced placement. So advanced placement um, is really a series of college level courses and exams that students can choose to take in high school. There is also an option of doing an advanced placement um, international diploma as well. We haven't had a lot of students do that over the years. We had a few before the pandemic. I don't think we had any last year. Um, but really the focus here is again, rigorous coursework, all of our high schools currently offer advanced placement. Mountain View and Summit High School by far offer the most courses in advanced placement. Um, I think it's on our next slide. Yeah, so 22, um, both of those high schools offer 22 advanced placement courses. And those um, really vary in terms of what students can take. So AP Music Theory, for example, is an advanced placement course that isn't just necessarily in the core. Um, we also offer AP Japanese and French and Spanish, and we offer AP Art Studio and AP Art History. So there's a lot of other sorts of variations of AP courses that are out outside, include in, in outside of the core areas. Um, lots of opportunity to earn um, college credit. Um, but students can take the test. They're guaranteed if they get a certain score, just like IB in, in certain states, to get the college credit. Um, we'll be hitting on college dual credit in just a minute. Um, a lot of our, it's particular at Mountain View, they embed a lot of college dual credit in their AP courses, so students have a couple options of how they can choose to get college credit, so you'll hear more about that in a moment from a couple of our teachers. Um, and then just want to talk briefly, which I've done a presentation on this before, so I'm not going to go into a lot of detail, but really hitting at how do we get more students who don't generally tend to go into AP, IB, college dual credit, into those high-level courses. And I think you're aware of the Equal Opportunity Schools um, initiative that we've had going at Mountain View for over 10 years now. Um, it's really the whole focus is trying to recruit students who wouldn't necessarily choose AP in particular as a course for them um, and really trying to design a system that, that builds that confidence and the skill and offers support for students to do well in those classes. And Mountain View's had a lot of excess, success there that I'll talk about in just a moment. So a few statistics, um, these are sort of correlate with the ones that you saw around IB. So really looking at the percentage of seniors who earn more, two or more AP credits in terms of all the priority populations that we, we really like to dig in on and we're gonna be spending more time um, seeing how can we get more of those students to, to be 
to enroll in the courses and to stay in the courses and be successful. Um, that here's some data around the Ever ELs and SPED students and seniors taking two or more AP courses. Gender, you see some discrepancies here in gender. Um, so again, back to the equity work. Uh, again, Mountain View is the one who's really been engaged in that the, by far the most over the last few years, and Stephen and I are working with um, the teams at each of the high schools now to really think about how can this system be replicated in our other high schools to try to ensure that those priority population students get into those courses and are successful. Mountain View High School um, has been in the top 1% for the last few years regarding students who are getting those priority populations who are staying in those courses and being very successful with them. Um, so I want to uh, ask um, a couple of our teachers to come up now um, and talk a little bit about what AP looks like at one of our high schools and then what does it look like to embed some of those college dual coursework courses into AP. And again, want to emphasize that every high school offers college dual credit. And what's nice about college dual credit is it can be, um, students can take advantage of that through AP courses, um, through CTE courses. Uh, there's a whole array of um, opportunities for college dual credit. So I'd like to invite Joel Clements to come up. He's a longtime language arts teacher at Mountain View High School. He's taught AP as well as dual credit. And then Sharon Siva King, who's an advanced math teacher at Mountain View. Same thing, a lot of experience teaching AP and then embedding the college dual credit. Hi, thanks for having me. Uh, yeah, as Katie mentioned, I've taught several AP courses over the years and a slew of dual credit courses. And I wanted to speak briefly to beyond the obvious, which is the college credit, which is, I think, so powerful and so meaningful and gives so many students a head start on their futures who may otherwise find that especially challenging. I think there's something less quantifiable but equally important, and that's the culture shift that goes with having dual credit, AP, and of course IB woven into the fabric of secondary education. Looking beyond, looking to the student quote here, and looking beyond the, 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 uh, the, the, the cost savings, et cetera, and looking at thinking about this real college expectation and the pre preparedness, I think the beauty of it, having it in the secondary level, is first off, having it woven in like that over the course of the year, they have more hours, more seat time, more uh, time with the instructor. They aren't expected to come into the class ready for college. Having that would create a tier, right, a, a, a domain of privilege. Students come in where they are and they exit ready for college. And think what that would mean to a student for maybe that wasn't uh, a sense previously. So as Cameron mentions in this quote here, it challenges them, it, it saves an enormous amount of money, and it also opens doors for students who might not have otherwise seen it. And going beyond just AP to the, the dual credit, where there, now there's no exam, they simply are enrolling through, commonly through CUCC, but some courses through other community colleges around Oregon, they are then in the course. It doesn't show up on a transcript as, oh, you took Writing 121 at Mountain View. They attended CUCC according to their transcript, and anywhere that will transfer, this will transfer. And this extends into so many different courses that again, we aren't talking about just the core academics. Whatever area a student is passionate in, they wanna challenge themselves in, they would like to see as part of their future, there is probably an avenue there for them to pursue. And that's that what I think becomes so powerful again, not just for the students who are trying to get a head start, but think what that would mean for a student who has made mistakes in their academics and they're trying to turn things around and they have something empirical to show a college, that they are ready. And of course, even more than that, perhaps, the student that maybe that isn't part of their family dynamic. It's never come up. And now they have something from their own efforts that shows them they can do it. And if they don't right away, even if they don't sign up for the college credit, a few years down the road when they realize maybe they would like to pursue further education and they have that there that they're able to. So looking at, again, and I, I can speak, of course, only to the site at which I work, Mountain View High School, there is no sense of who should take these courses. It's, it's there from beginning to end. It is there for all types of students. And whatever it is they're trying to seek out, whether it's CTE, whether it's Ivy League, whether it's Oregon colleges, anything, there's something there that will empower them, that will give them the college preparedness, give them a higher level of thinking, and find their place in academics. 
Uh, so to, to talk a little bit more about the, the math side of things, uh, let me turn things over to Sharon. So they gave me the data because I'm a math teacher, so. <laughs> and it's about my bedtime, so just to let you know that too. <laughs> so <clears throat> I don't know how long I've been teaching the dual credit. It's been a long time, maybe 15 years, I don't know. Uh, but it is really, I always thought it as the hidden program. And so I'm about to reveal something I don't think most of you know, because I don't think the school district keeps any data on college credit and who's doing the dual college credit. Do you have the data? We don't track it. So that's what I thought. So I've always thought it's Mountain View's hidden secret that nobody knows, so I'm about to reveal a big secret here. Um, so because we don't keep any data, I know that COC does because that's the biggest um, program. There are other schools, but that's the biggest program with Mountain View. And so their data is from the last three years here. You can see there's 686 enrollments in classes that were dual credit. Um, some students enroll in more than one class, often they do. So there are 293 students last year who took a dual credit class, at least one, so many several. That was 16 different classes that were offered and um, <clears throat> actual 42 sections of college credit classes. So um, you can also look by what classes there are. So you can see there's Math 111, that's one of them I teach, um, all the way down through, I, some of these I might not even know what they are. <laughs> we have so many at Mountain View. <clears throat> For the math side, we, um, we try to get every kid to take Math 111. That is one of our goals. We beg, we plead, we just say, you get in there, you will be surprised. It's in our pre-calculus class. It's just part of the class. And that really relieves students because it's not just one test. It's that entire class grade that counts for their um, COC grade. And one of the ways we do convince kids is we say, if you don't like math, get in there. Because this could be your one math class for college and then you could be done. So um, we do get a lot of kids in there and we try to get, we always want more, but we try. Uh, <clears throat> so that's that data. <coughs> see if I see this one. Let's see what we have on the next slide. So I have students come back to me all the time because I have the privilege of teaching a lot of senior level classes and they always thank me for the college credit. And one of the biggest reasons they thank me and their parents thank me. A lot of times I have parents, I will have parents coming in soon uh, for parent teacher conferences that have older kids and they always say, my so-and-so, you know what, you saved them a year of college. And that's what I always hear, and I love to hear this. But um, the cost savings, you just can't imagine the cost savings for them. Because they just have to pay $100 for Math 111 at Mountain View. That includes their fees and their books, and you know how much that would cost if they had to pay for that. It would be more than $100 right there. And so that amount of money is just so beneficial to students and their parents, probably their parents more. And so I asked some of my former students, and I've got a few quotes here, but the main takeaway is, I don't know how often this happens, but it's pretty often. They are essentially going into college as sophomores. And I actually had a student complain to me like, they want me to declare my major because I'm already a sophomore, but I don't want to declare my major yet. So I'm like, well, there's worse problems. <laughs> I love teaching it. I think it's bigger deal than the AP, and a lot of our college credit classes aren't AP. We have them in the AP, but there are also many that are not AP. Okay. Hey, Sharon. Yes. Uh, not exactly a question, but you mentioned the efforts to get students into advanced math. Uh, could you just mention the student-created videos? <laughs> I could, have, I could have put one of those up there. I should make one for Math 111, that's a very good point. Yeah, um, I think it started in COVID uh, because we usually at Mountain View, what we do, I assume maybe the other schools do that, we do a sort of a course fair in which students go around and they see the, um, and talk to all the different classes and teachers and then we, we try to convince them then, like you can do this class and here's what the class is about. 
Well, during COVID, we couldn't do that, so we created videos. So we have some really great videos that I would be happy to send to you that kids made to try to convince kids to take, take calculus. It's fun. Don't you want to be smart? It is stuff like that. So anyway, thank you. So, so just a couple of next steps regarding all of this. Um, uh, I think it was really nice to hear the highlight around that dual credit piece. Um, and I think it's worth pointing out that we are really working on expanding those opportunities. Um, and so um, building a partnership with COCC, um, there are some regulations when it comes to dual credit that um, slow the work a little bit that we're working around. For instance, um, when a teacher articulates with a college, um, they're subject to that college's requirements around their degrees um, to be able to teach. And the way that Oregon licenses teachers and TSPC licensed teachers doesn't always align. For instance, many of our uh, higher college courses require that individual to have a master's in the subject they teach. As you know, in our profession, many of the teachers have masters in teaching. And so um, it doesn't always translate perfectly, but what COCC has been willing to do and we're working with them is a, what's called a sponsored dual credit, um, where we can um, partner and they can provide training and guidance um, to our teachers to get them to a, a, a standard where they're observed by the college, and then they can become a, 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 a teacher that articulates that course. And so we're working on doing that um, and we're also working with COCC. Um, we've let them know um, a little bit around the fee structure that they have for students and seeing if there's any flexibility there um, to, to lower that $25 per credit cost for our students. And I just also want to point out that we have systems in place to support students financially, and so that's not a barrier um, if that's, a, that's an issue for students. So we are looking to increase those classes, and we also are looking to increase access um, for our priority populations to all of these programs. I think. That's it. So questions for any of the topics, or Katie or I? Yeah, um, just a question about the financial assistance piece, because mm -hmm. it was mentioned for dual uh, credit. Do we have financial assistance for IB and AP tests for students who are low income? Yes, we do for AP specifically. IB, Paul, yep, yes, so we do. Um, thank you. First of all, your um, enthusiasm is contagious, and it makes me so excited to see how far it's come since I graduated from Bend High, and it makes me really excited for my kids to go to high school in Bend Lapine, so thank you for all that. Um, I do just wanna come back to the funding question, um, and please correct me if mm -hmm. I misheard, um, but I this is not the first time um, this concern has been raised for me over the years. So what I heard was athletics is funded, period, without question, Principals have to use discretionary funding and figure out how to fund clubs and which clubs to fund. Um, and I experienced a, a similar um, discord when we were designing Caldera on the um, school design committee. Um, you know, it was the athletic rooms and fields and everything were unquestionable, um, but we were shaving feet and classrooms off of CTE rooms. Um, and so I am a huge proponent of athletics. I was an athlete in high school. I want my kids to be athletes, but I don't think it's more important than clubs and academics and career readiness. And so I just, it's, it's an ongoing concern. Um, I'd like to understand if what I heard is accurate. I don't think we get separate federal or state funding for athletics. If we do, correct me, but I feel like that's a district decision to say that that funding is separate, it's guaranteed, and everything else has to fight for it. I think just a couple of things to clarify when it comes to funding and funding structures, especially with our CTE programs. I think one other thing to note around our CTE programs um, is another requirement of a program to study is to have a student leadership group. And so with business, that's DECA, and there's a club component required. Um, when you have a full program of study, there is a lot of dollars that comes from high, uh, uh, Perkins to support that. Um, when it's a startup, um, the only funding from the federal is for around professional development for the teachers until they become a full program of study. Um, but Oregon has set aside uh, a large uh, sum for high school success um, that we do 
divert to schools. Um, uh, at the end of the day, though, I agree with you 100% that these programs are essential and equally as important. And uh, if there are instances where we're not able to get these clubs off the ground or um, we can't get these programs up off the ground, then that's something that we need to look at and take a, a look at how we do those things. I think I would just add, um, I want to make sure I understand, to clarify the ask, that, that there's an analysis of the funding that is directed specifically from the district towards athletics that is earmarked and clearly articulated that way that doesn't come from an outside revenue source and those funds that would be earmarked specifically for either career tech ed or clubs. Is that accurate? Yeah, and it's also just the, um, the assumption that every high school will offer every sport sort of without question, regardless of cost, and will provide the startup funding to ensure that it's able to start up and be successful, and that that is not the attitude towards clubs like DECA and others. Hey, I think. So let me, let, me, I, let me speak to that, and then. I was gonna just reframe a question. Okay. I think what it would be interesting from a board perspective to be able to see is what funding does the district give for extracurricular programs by classification, mm -hmm. athletics, theater, business, et cetera, um, so that we have that information. And then I think once we have that information, then we could go into analysis. Okay, that makes sense. I think the, yeah, that makes sense. I, we, we can gladly do that. Any other questions on our CTE, AP, IB, or college dual credit programs? One real fast. Um, if there are AP classes that are only offered at some schools but not others, do students have the opportunity, if they're not at that school, to access that coursework? So we do have a couple of options there. Um, we have area change requests, and that's a system that we have within our school for a student. Um, we're looking at that system as a whole to make sure that that system is equitable, um, but we do also um, have the opportunity for students to take that course at that site. Transportation scheduling can be a, a, a tricky issue there. Mm -hmm. um, the other option, though, um, is um, for some of these CTE programs, if they're interested, um, uh, an expanded options um, where we can have them take it at like COCC and earn dual credit in CTE and get certification through COCC as well. So if a student wanted to go that route and they knew like it was, they wanna be a dental technician, right? COCC's got a wonderful program there. Um, we could work with that student to get them um, taking a course up there that could also double count potentially as like a health sciences CTE credit in our school, but they're really earning the, the credit at the high school level. So there are options, um, but there are some logistical challenges as well. Totally a random question that I know I asked of you, Dr. Cook, and you weren't sure, but maybe one of you knows. Um, I had a parent bring up to me that they had a, a friend whose child was 14, but taking college level math and couldn't access the coursework through COCC because they had to be 15 to be on campus. What do we do to serve those kids? It's a good question. So there are some regulations when it comes to expanded options. For instance, there's some state regulations around age, and it's also in our policy around age um, that limits those students. Um, and so I would be thinking about um, what opportunities do we have within our current system, um, whether that is our, our, our Ben Lapine online classes or getting them in a more advanced classwork earlier um, at the high school site. If they are truly um, uh, advanced, can we challenge them in that way? Um, but those age restrictions that are there are, are they're, they're limiting. Okay, so that is a state restriction. Like, it's not something we have any way to work around. It's, it's a state restriction that you have to be 15 to be on a college I'm, campus. I'm gonna double check with Katie, but I'm pretty sure that's in the state regulation around expanded, 16 and expanded options for the state okay. regulation. Yep. Okay, thank you. Um, the nice thing that's uh, about college dual credit is the difference there is that you know students are taking the course on the high school campus um, taught by teachers who you know have the the master's degree in the content area and they're being vetted through the college and so on and i can tell you that we have about 120 
freshman students every year at Mountain View that take uh, AP uh, human geography and then they get eight credits of college credit through COCC by the end of that school year so those students we had to push on that one honestly um, but they were approved because they are not going to the college campus they are actually at the high school campus taking the courses from a teacher at Mountain View High School so that that's a that's a possibility that's a precedent that's been sent um, by our high schools so that's a good thing any other questions for Stephen or myself? Thank you. Just a huge appreciation. Thank you. And thank you to all of the staff from all of the different departments that came out as well as the students. What? Yeah. Good times. Seven C Division 22 assurances. And this time, Deputy Superintendent Laura Nordquist is actually going to address us. I'm thrilled to follow that presentation uh, with the Division 22 Assurances Report. Um, as, as our board is aware, uh, we have uh, Oregon administrative rules that we must follow as a district, and the Division 22 report is our assurances to the state that we are meeting, uh, meeting those standards. Um, last year, when I reported to the board, there were three areas where we did not meet Division 22 standards. One of those was, uh, the standard wasn't new, but there was no clarification anywhere in the state that online programs had to go through the curriculum adoption process. And so uh, with the leadership of Amy Tarno, our and Dean Richards' assistants, our Ben Lapine Schools online uh, staff went through the, uh, I would say, a. Uh, not a, quite as extensive as our regular curriculum review process, but they did do that, brought it to the board in June, and the board uh, accepted that curriculum in the August meeting. A second area where we did not meet the standards was with instructional time at our two choice high schools, Ben Tech Academy and Realms High School. And, and I wanna be honest with the board, this is a big challenge because in order to provide transportation for all students who want to attend those schools. Uh, they have to have shuttles, so they go to their neighborhood high schools and then catch a bus. So they're really limited um, in terms of their time. Uh, the, the school administrators worked very hard. Um, you know, we have a required length of lunch, so you couldn't shorten it beyond that, but brought the lunch to the minimum required standard, looked at passing time, and then uh, established kind of a, um, what I would call an informal connections time with students and staff first thing in the morning that, that brought them into compliance. And then the third area that was, um, I think the biggest challenge was the required time for uh, instructional minutes in physical education in K-8. Uh, and the way we worked, uh, Skip Offenhauser and Tammy Doty worked with the elementary team and Juan Quadros worked with a middle school team of administrators and health and PE teachers to find a solution that would work uh, as best it can for all our schools. Um, <clears throat> At the elementary school level, um, the schools have, I should say, we have a few schools that actually meet the time requirement with PE specialists based on the population of their schools. Um, but most of our schools had to look at some options to supplement their time with a PE specialist. Um, and there, there was a menu uh, developed by the team of three or four options, so you could have one of the one of the recesses and please remember that students have multiple recesses so this would not be true for all recesses but one that uh, is supervised by our certified teacher and maybe has planned activities that meet the standards um, classroom teachers could also do certain activities that meet the PE standards that at grade level by grade level um, and there are a couple of other options but each school has uh, uh, been required to say this is how we're addressing that at our school so as I'm uh, submitting the division 22 standards for this year uh, we do meet all those requirements I have Kinsey Martin is here um, this is not about the 21 22 standards but I thought it would be important for the board to know 
that next year when we report on the 22 and 23 standards, uh, we'll be uh, required to report on our new, the our district's new equ equity advisory committee. Um, and I'm proud to say with Kinsey's leadership and the work of the Equity Coalition, we'll probably be the only large district in Oregon that will be able to check yes, uh, that we were in compliance by September 15th um, with having an equity advisory committee. And Kinsey's going to give the details on that. All right, thank you for having me. I'm um, just looking and noticing it's at 720 and we're gonna jump into a topic about state legislation. Um, so um, it should only take us about two hours, so we should be good to go. Um, it, it should be pretty brief. Um, we just wanted to give you a quick update of where, um, where our equity coalition is in relation to Senate Bill 732 um, and how we are um, anticipating um, and, and really already meeting the um, requirements here. Um, so um, I'm actually gonna jump forward a slide to talk about this more um, chronologically. I think it'll be easier. That way, um, so we as a district uh, a couple years ago launched our, our own equity coalition. Uh, we had a, a group, um, sort of our core planning team that um, got together and thought a lot about how we wanted to um, form this group and, and to what end. Um, the purpose that's listed up there is um, to identify areas of inequity in our schools and learning systems and um, to co-design with our community uh, solutions and systems with an equity lens. And so we spent a really significant amount of time in our um, core group on the planning phase um, and thinking about how do we, um, brainstorm who who we know out there in the community who um, who can help us with this work who uh, represents traditional uh, you know groups or identities that we've traditionally um, you know pushed out of our systems and then how do we use those folks uh, partnership with us to go one step beyond the folks that we can think of and um, instead of asking the people that that come to mind to us first that we we know we have partnerships and relationship and trust with already how do we um, partner with them to um, to think of folks whose voices aren't yet at the table um, and so we we did sort of a, a layered approach to um, identifying folks and then um, a um, word of mouth and, and sort of individualized invitation process, um, connecting individually with each uh, potential candidate, and um, and that is sort of how we formed our initial group um, that has grown and, and shifted with time, as to be expected. Um, and we have, in addition to our core steering group, who were not voting members of the group, we're there to support um, and, and partner with the rest of the committee members. Um, we have student representatives, we have uh, parent family members, we have community members, and then some staff members who make up certified classified administrative roles um, in our district. So uh, a really great group of folks um, who we've been meeting most Mostly we, we launched all of it virtually and um, just started meeting in more of a hybrid in-person format, which has been really exciting. Um, and so um, as we were doing all of that, then the state uh, was, at the same time was starting to talk about um, their desire for um, equity advisory committees. This was Senate Bill 732. Um, and, and what the state was hoping to do um, was essentially pretty similar work to what we were also doing um, as far as making sure that the voices of community members who are traditionally, um, if not left out, pushed out of our, our system um, are included more actively and, um, and are protected in that way um, to prioritize the voices of, of our students and families who, um, who aren't necessarily at the table with us. Um, and, then, and then to ensure that this isn't a um, side gig for us, that this is connected to um, the fabric of our leadership and decision-making systems in the district, that um, there's a direct connection to the school board, to the superintendent's office. Um, that was very much a, a key piece of the state's um, intent with seven, uh, Senate Bill 732. Um, so then we, we started to talk about, all right, we've got our existing group and um, the state uh, passed 732 and um, 
along with that, we all know, you know, um, great ideas, and then they sort of work their way through legislation, and what comes out at the end is, um, you know, um, sometimes there's pieces we have to sort of um, retrofit or, or understand, and so we went through and really thought about what are the requirements of seven, uh, Senate Bill 732 and these um, equity advisory committees, um, which our group, group was kind of... Um, just noticing the very dry nature of the, the title of that group. Um, but um, not to be confused with our, uh, there's another acronym for EAC already in education. So um, this one is, um, we're trying not to refer to it as an EAC. It is an equity advisory committee. Um, and so every district is required to have this, uh, this committee, this uh, structure. Um, smaller districts don't need to have it quite yet, but we are definitely in the category that we need to have it up and running as of um, about a month ago. And um, there's pretty specific rules. These are some, some key ones. Um, most of them we, uh, we've sort of talked about as far as underserved populations and our priority populations, um, and that there needs to be a consistent process for identifying group members. Um, and then that, again, that this group isn't something that, that lives on the side and does their own thing, but that they are really integrated into the decision-making processes of the district, that they have a direct connection with you all um, as a board, and, um, and that the public has access to that work as well. Um, and, then, and then a pretty particular uh, component down there at the bottom, that one member of the group must be a liaison between the budget committee and, um, and the equity advisory committee, which, um, Makes a lot of sense as far as resource allocation and um, an equity lens there. So those were the requirements. And so we, our team was really looking at these requirements and our existing group and trying to layer them and see what do we already have uh, in place and what needs attention is essentially the work that we've been doing. Um, and so for the most part, our equity coalition, um, which we're continuing to call it our equity coalition, but it meets the function of the equity advisory committee. Um, there, there's not a significant change in format or structure. So um, our current membership and um, recruitment nomination process continues. That's a very uh, consistent onboarding process that we have. Um, our meetings, uh, the schedule format, um, as well as the focus and efforts of the group. All of those things will essentially remain the same, um, and we were pretty pleased that, um, that the work we were doing with our group was um, meeting the, the intent and the heart of this legislation um, already. And then um, the, we also really wanted to protect that um, our group is, um, has been designing and identifying the topics that they want to talk about, the issues that they see as relevant and urgent to address, and we wanted to make sure that that would um, continue to be in place. Um, a couple of changes that we did make, um, just and, and things that, that are really great changes to, to have in place, um, thinking about how do we share out the work of our equity coalition with our community on a regular basis. Um, we've, we've had um, in our, the back of our minds connecting with you all um, even before that was a requirement, um, but this is kind of a nice next step and, and the group was um, ready to be thinking about that piece anyway. Um, Likely that will look like um, bringing some representative members of the Equity Coalition to talk with you all um, at a couple meetings a year. We'll have um, meeting materials available to the public on, on the website. Um, once a budget committee position opens, we will definitely make sure we have a liaison uh, between the two groups. And then um, the other piece that um, feels like a natural um, adjustment we were kind of um, already starting to do a little of this is that there might be times that we as a district want to take something to the group and ask for their consultation or um, advising on a particular topic or that you all want something to be um, picked up by that group and, and reviewed and so um, we just um, it, it, I'm not sure it's even a change. We just sort of wanted to make sure that both of those things had space, that um, the group is not losing their ability to select topics and that um, we also might bring some topics uh, to the group as well. So um, I think those are, yeah, that's, those are the key points. And, and this is sort of just the logistics of how those two pieces are merging. Uh, I think the fun stuff will come more when we can bring members and talk about the actual work that we're doing, because it's a, a pretty wonderful group of folks and um, lots of really um, deep discussion and um, neat work that has uh, systems change that's coming out of the group already. So, yeah. Thank you. Do any of our remote members have any questions? 
No, thank you. Okay. Um, I did have one question, Kenzie. Okay. Um, it was really a concern early in this process as we were taking our coalition and then adhering to the, the new um, regulations. And my understanding um, was that there was some chilling effect, if you will, um, mm. for some of our members um, when everything had to be more um, uh, a little bit of a chilling effect that they might be um, attacked. And so I'm just, mm -hmm. I'm curious if you could speak to that and, and if that has in fact played out and how yeah. it's affected the, the coalition. Yeah, thank you. That definitely is um, an issue that not only in Ben Lapine, but around the state um, for lots of districts have um, versions of, of structures or advisory groups in place um, and, and many even who didn't that was one of the first concerns that came up is how do we you know um, these these uh, structures are taking on pretty significant topics and important topics um, and so how do we make sure that there is comfort and trust in that process um, and so especially when we are asking priority populations who you know we have not necessarily earned that trust um, yet and so how do we um, you know maintain that and protect that um, and and so, you know, we've had a lot of conversation with the state around um, the expectations and, and how to, um, you know, because like I mentioned, we also want our community to know what we're working on and what's coming out of this. And so um, got some reassurance from uh, the state level that, um, that sharing with the community can be done in ways that also is, um, you know, protects and upholds the, the integrity of the group and, um, and that trust that is recognized as a, an important piece. Um, we also talked about this over the course of a handful of meetings with our group and just made sure that everyone understood what we are and aren't talking about. We even, at, at one point um, in maybe our last meeting or the meeting before, um, as we sort of really processed through all of this and, and talked about, um, you know, coming and sharing at this type of a forum um, or posting things online when we have, um, you know, quarterly reports and notes and that kind of thing. Um, and gave the whole team the choice if, if anybody was feeling like, you know what, this is not for me anymore. Um, not a single member felt that way. And so I think that was a good sign that um, the, the, the medium that we found that, that meets those requirements and also upholds privacy and, and trust is um, feeling good at this point. So definitely something we'll keep an eye on and, and make sure it continues to feel good to folks. Great, thank you, that's great to hear. Yeah, awesome. Okay, then we will go into the chair report. It is late. Um, poor Steve, I'm gonna go first again, <laughs> and I bet we're gonna have some overlap. Um, from the chair report, I have uh, two pieces to report. Um, over the last month, we have had our um, vacant position for our um, zone seven at large seat uh, posted. We have, I believe, about a dozen applications. We had an information session that was well attended and we will look forward um, as a board to be uh, to the next month where we will be reviewing those and determining who we move forward as a semifinalist. Oh gosh, I just got a note that says almost 20. Um, I've always said that Bend is like a last minute RSVP community and the same is true for applications. We also got several in paper, so um, oh boy. I, we have a lot of reading to do, team. Um, so we have been very focused on that work um, over the past month. And then the other piece has just been, and I'll try and leave, Steve, you just tell me if I'm saying too much, but really getting out there and doing a lot of presentations in our community about Measure 9-155, which is the school bond. We're really excited. Um, Steve and I have been tag teaming, going to uh, Rotaries and um, EDCO and uh, neighborhood associations and anywhere and everywhere to try and help people understand that we have a bond measure. It is pretty incredible. Um, one of the things I always say about uh, this team at Ben Lapine Schools is that we have a finance and a facility team that are fiscally conservative, which I love. I am a fiscally conservative person. Um, and also part of being fiscally conservative is making sure that you maintain your facilities. Um, we have 
three million square feet of facilities, um, and our facilities team has done an amazing job of maintaining and continuing to improve. And so um, with that, really being able to go and tell people that we have the right team in place, this is the next thing that they're suggesting, and the great news is that with that um, being so fiscally strong, we've been able to retire bonds early, so this is gonna come with no increase in taxes, um, and that we have traditionally been able to um, do these constructions with local companies, so it really sustains jobs in our communities. Um, I'm excited about the safety improvements. I'm excited um, about fire alarm systems <laughs> um, and all of those types of things, but I am really, I, I can't think of a better thing to, to, and Steve can't say this, so I'm going to, um, uh, I can't think of a better investment for our kids and for our schools to continue our stewardship. And, um, and so I, uh, I encourage people to read up um, on the measure. And if you want us to come speak to your group, just let us know. And that, that's from me. Uh, next is superintendent's report. So now I only have two items to talk about in the superintendent's report because I would have said almost the exact same thing, um, just short of the advocacy piece. Um, I, I would just reiterate and double down that um, if there are groups that are interested in hearing from us, this is a road show that we're glad to take and, and do in uh, just about any conditions or locations and we can do it virtually in any way, shape or form and provide lots of information for what's really being asked for. And uh, we've been, uh, been doing that and are glad to continue doing that through the month of October and all the way up to the election. Um, the second thing I would like to report on is, uh, is, our, uh, is the Care Solace program. If you recall, we uh, launched the Care Solace program back in early September to uh, co coincide with the start of school. And Care Solace is a, uh, a, a partnership between the Benlapine Pine Schools and, uh, and local providers uh, to support our students and their family members with complimentary and confidential care coordination service for uh, either mental health needs or substance abuse needs. And we've gotten our first kind of feedback report on that partnership. And we've uh, just in the month of September and the first week of October, we've already seen uh, over 300 interactions and uh, saved almost 2,000 communications with 58 warm handoffs from folks in our system to service providers in the community that are going to help with accessing and supporting uh, folks in with either mental health concerns, needs, or wants support or substance abuse um, uh, requests and, and support on how to deal with that. Um, that's within uh, less than a, in a month of existence. And so such a tremendous example of community partnerships and how that's been implemented so far uh, and really a testament to our team's work to try to provide those access points for our students and our families. Um, the last thing I want to share, um, you are quite aware that we had an incident at Miller Elementary School in which we, uh, by policy, painted over um, some local art that was created by one of our artists here in town. Um, we've had a lot of conversation about that particular incident, and um, I, I've met personally with the artist that created uh, that those murals and that artwork, and uh, and. I, I, you know, while it was a difficult situation and we've talked a lot about how we've learned from it, um, a couple of things that are going to come out of this I think are a little bit positive. Um, one more certain than the other. I think the, the, the policy as it exists right now is not necessarily flawed, but I think we could use some flexibility in it. And so we're going to be digging into that policy a little bit. And more importantly, what, what came from this was an attention to the importance of uh, I'll just call it beautification of our elementary schools. And there's been lots of conversation, specifically with uh, T. Fly, the artist that uh, did the artwork at Miller Elementary School. Um, this idea of maybe partnering with our local artists here in town and, and creating a system in which they can adopt one of our elementary schools and work uh, to create some custom artwork in, in accordance with best practices and standards that we could comply with uh, across the district to actually use local art as a form of uh, spreading joy and, and beautification of our elementary schools and um, getting uh, establishing a way that we can uh, move forward from this whole entire event and come up with a, an approach 
that actually will have positive outcomes over time. And so we're excited to dig into that, to figure out a way to partner with our artists. I had a very, very good and constructive conversation with T fly. They were uh, very supportive of the idea of, of let's turn this into something positive and, and make it a, a powerful experience. And so um, look for updates on that in the future. We'll be doing some of that work here in the future. And I see that as an opportunity for us to, um, the, the metaphor of, of create lemon lemonade out of uh, lemons. And, and a lot of people are interested in this. A lot of people have stepped forward to say, um, what can I do to help? Let's, what, what's a way that we can do this in a more receptive and open fashion? And so we're looking forward to that conversation and, and uh, we'll have more to follow up on that in the very near future. And I'm glad to answer any questions. Thank you. I'm going to very quickly revert back to 7D because I forgot to ask if any of my fellow board members had anything that they needed or wanted to report on. No, no. Report mem remote members? All right. Then we will move into our action items. Our first action item tonight is item 8A, which is our board member zones. Um, as we went through um, in our last meeting, we looked at the board member zones um, to determine um, what we would do, and we were looking to ensure the following, that we had alignment of board member zones with Deschutes County precincts, because the precincts had changed, we needed to change the zone boundaries. We wanted to have equal division of population um, where practical, and just to note again, we chose not to do equal um, distribution for zone four, because the only way to do that would be to take part of Ben's population, which meant that that zone would not necessarily be guaranteed to be rep represented by a South County res res resident, and so we prioritized that. Um, balancing the number of schools per zone, um, making sure that there was an elementary, middle, and high school, and then reducing the impact on current board members. We put forward two different um, uh, zones, uh, number zone A, well, option A and option B, um, and the recommendation during our, well, we called them one and two, I thought, but uh, we had option A and option B, and the recommendation from our COO, CFO was option A. Um, and so now that we have them before us again, I am ready to entertain a motion um, from the board for adoption of one of the two. Um, proposals. I will move to approve uh, resolution 1938 board member zone realignment option A. I second that motion. Thank you. Director Tatum has moved. Director Legrand um, has seconded. I will take a roll call vote. Director Olson. Aye. Director Montgomery. Aye. Director Legrand. Aye. Director McPherson Douglas. Abstain. Director Tatum. Aye. And I am an aye. Motion passes with five ayes and one abstention. Thank you. We will now move into item 8B, which is the Jewel litigation led by Superintendent Cook. Thank you, Chair barnes Delacchia. As you may recall, um, the state of Oregon received settlement, um, along with many other states in the nation, regarding uh, litigation over the uh, vape maker Juul for marketing practices. Um, this uh, was exclusionary of school districts, and there's a recognition that school districts may actually have a reason to be interested in, in formalizing um, litigation as well as a claimant regarding that. Um, this goes back to as early as 2019, um, seeing impact uh, locally and statewide um, from vape use in our schools. And um, there's a, uh, a law firm, excuse me here, I'm gonna f find it again. Yes, uh, law firm Keller Rohrbach. Um, has agreed to represent school districts that are interested in pursuing this action. Um, what we would be requesting 
um, from the board is uh, permission and approval to partner with that law firm uh, to pursue any financial interest or reimbursement of costs in, that could be attributed to our efforts in the, for about the last 10 or 12 years in, uh, in preventing and, and working through issues with vaping in our schools and uh, determining whether or not there's enough there to, to investigate and be a part of. Um, it is required to partner with this law firm that we have board approval. At this time, we would recommend uh, engaging with them and we would ask for your approval of that motion. Do we have a motion? I move to approve the attorney engagement and contingency fee agreement between Binlam Pine Schools, Keller Rollerback, LLP, and High Desert Education Service District. I second the motion. Thank you. Director McPherson Douglas has moved and Director Olson has seconded. I will take a roll call vote. Director Olson? Aye. Director Montgomery? Aye. Director Legrand? Aye. Director McPherson Douglas? Aye. Director Tatum? Aye. And I am an aye. Motion passes unanimously. We'll now move into board policies for action. Ooh. As the final part of the review process for board policies, the following policies, governance processes, executive limitation, board ends and board staff linkages are up are before the board for approval. As a reminder, we went into these in depth at our last meeting. AC-BP, non-discrimination. GBEA-BP, workplace harassment. GBN-JBA-BP, sexual harassment. J, excuse me, G B N A A slash J H F F dash B P, suspected sexual conduct with students and reporting requirements. G B N A B slash J H F E dash B P, suspected abuse of a child reporting requirements, and. JFCF-BP, hazing, harassment, intimidation, bullying, menacing, cyberbullying, teen dating violence, or domestic violence student. There was no public feedback received on any of the policies. The board ends are also before the board for approval. The document was recently shared during the September 27th, 2022, 2022 work session. <laughs> The edits requested during the work session have been made to the document. Do we have a motion to approve these policies as presented? I will move to approve the board policies uh, as presented. Second. Thank you. Director Tatum has moved. Director McPherson Douglas has seconded. I will take a roll call vote. Director Olson? Aye. Director Montgomery? Aye. Director Legrand? Aye. Director McPherson Douglas? Aye. Director Tatum? Aye. And I am an aye. Motion passes unanimously. We will now move into board policies for review. As part of policy governance, the governance processes, executive limitations, board ends, board staff linkages, and specific district policies require board approval. JG BP. Student conduct and discipline is being reviewed by the board. The policy includes updated language to reflect Ben Lapine School's commitment to restorative practices, school interventions, and practices as part of student discipline. The policy has been renamed from an administrative policy to a board policy as policies required, required by law must be approved by the board. Are there any questions or concerns that board members have regarding the revisions to the policy? Hearing no questions or concerns, the policy will be reviewed for the next 30 days and public feedback will be accepted via Google form, which is linked in the board packet and available on the policies page of the district website until 5 p.m. on Tuesday, October 25th, 2022. A summary of the changes is provided in the board packet. 
We will now move. Chair oh. Barnstock. Yep. Yeah, I just I want to <laughs> emphasize the importance of this particular policy. Mm -hmm. This is a uh, th this was a, a large work in progress, and we're number one. We were excited to be able to put produce this for this uh, this month. First of all, as uh, focusing the work, the revision of the, the student discipline code, if you will, to focus on a more restorative approach. And secondly, to move that out of administrative policy and into board policy. And I think both of those points need to be, have specific attention drawn to them. Um, we're excited to have this out for public comment, for public review, and also for the board's input and feedback. Thank you. We'll now move to item number 10, Administrative Policy and Regulation Report. Executive Limitation 12 requires the superintendent to admit, amend administrative policies to comply with local, state, and federal law, provide the school board with information regarding substantive changes made to policies, and create policies that are consistent with new laws. I will now turn to Dr. Cook to present the administrative policies and regulations the district is reviewing and adopting. Thank you, Chair barnes Delacchia. Yeah, we have two policies uh, that are currently up for consideration. The first one, IGBI-AP, Bilingual Education. This includes updated language to reflect revisions to the OAR to include language assistance to allow for students to participate in education activities outside of classroom instruction. Um, the second one, IGBI-AR, what? Slow on the oh, gotcha. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry. Um, also IGBI-AR, bilingual education, is a new administrative regulation that defines the district's commitment to supporting bilingual education. Uh, the definitions and terms, the programs and services, and guidelines that will be used to inform classroom, school, and systems that are practiced are explained. Um, the regulation in this the language in this regulation also aligns with JBB-AP, our educational equity policy. Um, we are going to submit these out for 30-day public review. Um, feedback from uh, board members and or the public will be accepted via Google form, which will be uh, linked in the board packet and on our policy webpage until 5 p.m. on Tuesday, October 25th, 2022. Thank you. Thank you. And now for adoptions. Um, just as we, you went through each of the policies that were broken up for board policies, there are administrative regulations in a similar fashion that are, have been split apart. Um, the uh, not discrimination policy, um, the workplace harassment reporting process, um, hazing, harassment, intimidation, bullying, menacing, cyberbullying, reporting procedures and how those are administered by staff, um, the suspected sexual conduct reporting procedures, the suspected sexual conduct reporting processes, and the reporting of suspected child abuse. Um, those uh, procedures, those pro uh, forms, and those policies went out for public review. Um, we did not receive any public comments similarly, and th therefore those will go into adoption um, officially tonight. Thank you. Woo! All right, home stretch, people, stick with us. Um, we are moving on to board comments. I will first ask um, remotely. So, Director Olson, do you have any comments? I would just simply like to acknowledge the work and the uh, presence of all of our high school folks talking about all those high school programs. Uh, we've, we've talked about the information um, specifically over this last year, and that was a very comprehensive review. And um, I'm hoping that, that we have the opportunity to really observe um, most of those programs in process. Thanks to the staff. Director Montgomery. Thank you, Shirley. I share those comments. Thank you to all the staff. Director Legrand. Yes, I want to thank the staff also for leaning into the bias training that we're doing in our schools as well. I know that can be very difficult having some of those conversations in your class. And I just want to thank you for the hard and continuous work. I know the you know the district and 
all our schools are doing a great job from every level. And I want to appreciate all the teachers and staffs for working so hard to make that happen. Okay. Director McPherson Douglas. Um, I just want to reiterate the importance of voting yes in support of our school bond. Um, and just two additional points um, beyond what Melissa said. Uh, well, first of all, a huge thank you to the board before us who put together the last bond um, and the huge improvements and additions that that added to our city. Um, and the previous board also put a requirement in place as part of that bond to do an external, I don't know if audit is the right word, Laura, but to have an external company review um, the process that our facilities team goes through um, when implementing a bond. And that audit firm, found nothing. I mean, they found a couple of small things, but they were so impressed with our team here and how well we manage our facilities and our finances and our long-term maintenance. Um, and just, it was uh, really great to have that objective external assurance that when our community passes a bond, the money is really well managed and spent for the future of our community. Um, and then second, I would just, I, I often say the day a city stops investing in its public schools is the day that city starts to decline. Um, and I think that sometimes I hear people say, well, if I don't have kids in the school, why should I vote for this? What is the benefit? Um, and I just firmly believe that a high quality public school system which includes high quality facilities, touches every part of every person's lives um, that lives in our community from the safety that we experience, um, people's desire to live here, to work here, to raise their families here, and the preparation of a workforce um, that impacts how we experience every aspect of our day-to-day -day life. So if you already support the school bond, please um, tell five friends. Um, if you are uncertain, please search out more information, ask any of us um, and uh, yeah vote yes thank you Carrie just said everything that I could possibly want to say so I'm just gonna say vote yes as well thank you um, I have just uh, two additional pieces um, one uh, I was able to visit um, our alternative learning options um, over the last several weeks and was able to go to uh, Oregon Youth Challenge. I was able to go to um, Academy at Sisters, J Bar J, and then J the J5 program at the Juvenile Justice um, Center. And I think that that was just, you know, we talked a lot about CTE um, tonight and it was really great to see, you know, some of the same modules happening um, at J Bar J that are happening at Ben Tech and their director saying, oh yeah, I was talking to Sal last week, da 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 da. Um, and so just uh, really proud of our district for all of the ALOs that we um, authorize. And then wanted to say that this morning we were able to celebrate Jessica Weisgerber um, at R.E. Jewel Elementary. And for anyone who hasn't gone to R.E. Jewel and seen those kids and their Spirit, man, the Jaguars were so excited. Their cheer is amazing. And they were so excited for their media specialist. Um, so it was just a fantastic um, opportunity. And then last, um, a couple of appreciations. I want to appreciate uh, Janet Bojanowski. I'm always appreciating her, but man, she does so much work for us. Um, but just all of the work of gathering um, all of these applications and putting them together to share with the board. I'm really holding that um, has been an amazing assistance to us. Um, and then um, I wanted to thank Michelle Emery, who has offered to support with uh, Central Oregonians for Responsible Education. That is the PAC that does the outside work to support um, our school bond. And so thank you to Michelle for stepping in and, and supporting us. And with that, I and will. Just one other thing, just thank you to everyone who has applied um, for the appointment. We really appreciate everyone that has um, put effort and thought and interest into joining this board and contributing to our community in that way. Yeah, absolutely. And cannot wait to read through all of those, um, all of those applications. Thank you. Um, anything else, Superintendent Cook? Great, then this meeting, whoop, I gotta say when the next meeting, sorry, just a second, pull up my other. And everyone's like, Melissa. 
Our next meeting is a work session scheduled for October 25th, 2022. And our next regular business meeting is scheduled for November 8th, 2022. And that is actually going to be held in South County at Lapine High School. With that said, this meeting is adjourned. <laughs>